go to the east and to the uh, or to the nature to the extreme situations like living in the desert or spending time with Tibetans or Aborigines or go to Micronesia and there I will get the energy and ideas for the art and then I will come to the Western society and I will serve like a bridge. Modern physics and modern science in general lead us to a worldview which is profoundly ecological. Ecological in the sense that it takes into account of the fundamental interconnectedness and interdependence of all phenomena and of the fact that we are embedded in larger systems. We are embedded in the cyclical processes of nature. I don't know any scientist which has scientific tools to understand the understanding, to go beyond the object, to deal with the subject in a non-objectifiable way. You, you probably know that the, the Taoist expression for evil is that evil exists because there's goodness. Mm. And that means that there's dualism. If you can bring the dualism back to one, which you can also call integrity. Integrity is a very interesting word because it means wholeness. Although the very existence of mankind is at stake, anything goes, so nobody actually does anything, states Raymond Panikar, Catholic priest and Hindu scholar. He plays the game, but doesn't abide by the rules. He spends six months of the year writing at his home in the Catalan mountains near Barcelona. Clinging to the mechanistic worldview of Newton and Descartes, has brought us perilously close to destruction, warns Fritjof Capra, theoretical high-energy physicist. We are at a turning point in all aspects of our culture. The paradigm shift toward a systemic worldview is crucial because without it, there will be no future. Marina Abramovic, draws strength from nature and ancient cultures. Her quest turned into a personal investigation of physical limits and mental potential as she attempts to gain control of her body and mind to actually transcend matter through her performances and other works of art. My view of the world is the view of an artist's view of the world. And how I see the uh, the world now is, um, I'm so busy actually, uh, not so much about this century, but about 21st century, more even than this one I'm we're living in. But I really believe that um, the future, this 21st century, will be a world without really art in the kind of um, sense we, we're having it now. There will be uh, the, the world without objects, where the human being can be on such a high uh, level of the consciousness and kind of strong mental state that they can transmit the, the salt and the energy to the other people just without actually um, having objects in between. So there will not be sculptures and no paintings, or no installations. There will be just the artists who stand in the front of the public and the public who is developed enough to can receive such a message and such energy. And they just sit or stand like the samurais in old uh, Japan, look each other and they transmit their uh, uh, energy. So new ideas uh, are an expression of the creativity of a scientist. And there is no science without creativity. That's at the very core. When you do scientific research, you go into a new terrain and, and you create novelty. And usually what this means is to connect things, to see a new pattern. You don't, you don't create ex nihilo from nothing, but you create new patterns of ideas, new, new connections. I really think there was a lack of, of contact between artists and, and scientists, and I think that this contact should be reestablished. And also, the, some scientists, I mean, 
when the scientists really, uh, when they say, when they come to the discovery, they never come to discovery in an ordinary way, like, you know, mathematical formulas and you sit in the studio or in, in your scientist's laboratory and you come to the great discovery. Always come in, a, in the same way as artists create the piece. And this is a very interesting touching point. Come from another state of mind, again, not from that, uh, uh, how you call the rational state. And there is where, where we could have the dialogue. When, when, um, when things come from subconscious, from another, from we call inspiration, art is called a very old fashioned word, but it exists, inspiration. And there is the, the, the field where artists can talk with the scientists on that level. To create a new vision, a new way of seeing things, a new way of understanding, of expressing things, a new way of self expression. And uh, so, since we now need a new perception of reality. It is very important to find the most creative ways of expressing this new perception and the most uh, persuasive and convincing ways. This is the only one is Nikola Tesla, who was yeah. busy about magnetic fields, who was busy about anti-gravitation, who was busy about you know, energy fields. I mean, and he had incredible visions to, um, that every object and every human being and every plant and every, anything on this planet have his own wavelengths of frequencies. And uh, so uh, there is, a, he talked about idea of parallel worlds, that actually in this world we live in many, many parallel worlds, but we only can communicate with our own world with the, with the objects who are with the same wavelengths. And if it's not the same wavelengths, we, we, um, uh, we actually, uh, the, the everything else is invisible. So uh, when we talk about spirituality, the people talk about this invisible world, what well, we don't have the proof because it's not physical, but exists. But now science is discovering that this actually invisible world exists. There are hundreds of parallel worlds. And I'm fascinated by the idea of being in this space and just by changing my wavelength, I, I disappear from in the front of your eyes and I reappear in the same room, but with another, in another order, with another, another setup. I mean, this is... A, it would be incredible to, to, to uh, work with a scientist and an artist together and make such things possible. Do you feel that you were accepted? by well, the Catholic Church. I was. <laughs> you was. <laughs> because I want to reform myself. I don't want to reform the church. That's not my business. And then there's more tolerance than it looks like if you stick to what you uh, feel you should do and you don't speak in the name of the church or whoever. I speak under my own responsibility. You want to put it in, in a slightly ironical way, I enjoy the privilege of not being infallible. With monkhood it's different. You can be a Hindu monk a Christian monk, a Buddhist monk, uh, a Tibetan monk, uh, a Shinto monk, uh, whatever. So monkhood is prior to the split of the vision or division in religious confessions. So then I was led to uh, investigate what is that kind of thing which makes Christian, Buddhist, Hindu an adjective when the noun is monkhood, is the monk. So in monkhood, there is a prior dimension, perhaps the ur dimension, yeah, the ur, uh, yeah. a, a kind of primordial trait of being human, which then splits in different ways. But I think this is the time that we should really put forces together, and there is not a point anymore to is artist, scientist, biologist, or, or a spiritual leader. I think that we have all have the same aim, but till now we don't, we didn't been um, how you call introduced to yes. each other in a way, and that's why I think this meeting is extremely important. Well, if I listen to you, I have the feeling that you believe that you can change the world. You know, I will not even start if I don't believe that.
I can say what art is like breathing. You must breathe to live. As the Brancusi said once, and I always repeat this sentence because it's essential for the, my ideas about art, is that it's not important what are you doing, what form what you're doing takes, it can be painting, installation, sculpture, performance, or whatever, is you can you also sit in the bank and, and sign the checks. What is important is from which state of mind you're doing what you're doing. Somebody said, let's get back to nature, but how? So my theory is about two things. It's about cleaning the house inside and cleaning the house outside. Now, cleaning the house inside is, of course, our body. Um, once I was on the train sitting with the rabbi and uh, the, the one very old man, we discussed some things, and this old man said, what, what is your, uh, what you're doing? And he said, I'm for uh, 40 years working in a crematorium, just burning the bodies. And we had a very interesting conversation, and in the end he said me something that really, really struck me. He said, you know, 40 years ago, to burn the human body in crematorium, you need 125 degrees. These days, you need 715 because of chemicals in our body who increase. I mean, this is a fact. So this is our house inside. So now, to come back to this uh, less is more, <laughs> what we need is to empty our house. That's what we need. To me, ecology is the meeting ground of all these uh, endeavors. Uh, Abramovich says that she wants to clean the body, and this is her main uh, emphasis. Now, ecology at the deepest level is an identification of the earth household with the self. It's, it's this spiritual link between uh, the self and the cosmos, and therefore cleaning the body becomes then also cleaning the earth household. And this uh, experience of connectedness, of belonging to the cosmos, of being embedded in the cosmos is the very essence of spiritual or religious experience. So at the deepest level, uh, ecology is spiritual and uh, ecology, of course, is the very necessary required context now for economics. The reason that our economics fails, the reason that economists don't understand the economy and not able to solve economic problems is that they lack an ecological context. And that's what crucially must be uh, introduced. So ecology is really the meeting ground. Fritjof Kapra says the new criterion should be sustainability. I understand that it has importance. But if you make that the only criterion, it would indeed mean stopping growth because then you could not use any metals, any oil, anything that we take for mines and so on. You could right. wouldn't use it anymore. It wouldn't even mean stopping growth. It would mean reducing growth, reducing production. No. So it's impossible. No. Yeah. Well, you know where you can get metals from? From recycling. Well, yes. The recycling industry will give you the raw materials. To, to some extent. But you couldn't do everything with that as yet. But do we need everything that we less produce is now? Less better, don't forget. Right, in less world, is better. In the world as a whole, that we have always heard, heard during these days that so many people are still poor. We need uh, still some growth. Uh, well, they don't eat metals, do they? All very nice to have wonderful ideas, but we should be realistic at the well, same time. You know, I, I have... Wait, 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 wait. No, I need to respond to this. I have a four-year-old daughter, you know, and... When she is an adult, I would like her to be able to breathe. If we do not introduce sustainability as a criterion, as a constraint to the price mechanism, I all, I'm all for the free market forces, but not free, you know, constrained, <laughs> regulated market yeah, we forces. We. Yeah, we. If we do not introduce sustainability, then my daughter won't have a chance. Well, well. See? Now you exaggerate again. No, I'm not exaggerating. Because I have been saying that I want these ecological concerns brought into the price mechanism. The yes. only thing I'm saying now is you can't be so extreme as to say that you are not allowed to mine any resources anymore from now well, on. That's obviously, the only thing I we'll say. have a transition stage, well, but that I'm must saying. be the ideal. That's you see, sustainability must, we're not going to introduce it tomorrow, that's clear, well, but that must be the I'm ideal. Saying. 
And so far, it's not even addressed by economists. That's, well, you know, let me just that's add, not true either. <laughs> you have these, you have these uh, meetings um, of, the, of the G7, right? Uh, the economic summits. At every summit, they repeat, you know, growth, a healthy economy, so much growth at the GNP. Why don't economists stand up and say it's pure nonsense? Because we know it's pure nonsense. The GNP does not measure the health of an economy. What I am concerned with, is that the framework in which we work. To me, the period of reformation is over. We have to head towards a period of transformation, metamorphosis, uh, to substitute the very word development. Development is still, in the best sense of the word, crypto-colonialism. Because uh, you say development, sustainable, not sustainable, good, bad, uh, slowly, but the very concept of development has a very uh, uh, particular anthropology that the, 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 the meaning of life is to develop in one way or another. And then we call peoples on the way to development. What if we were to translate, and accuse me on the, the, on the other side, that we said awakening oh. in state of development? or realization. We have been believing for too long that our culture, which is the predominant one, which is great, it's enormous, it's fantastic, is the only one and can provide the solution and the models for the world predicament today. Are we talking about global interdependence, global partnership, or are we talking about global exploitation? Mm -hmm. And most uh, economic policies and most business policies today, as we know, are more in the, in the direction of global exploitation than global partnership. So there needs to be a shift in values together with the shift in thinking. If the thinking shifts to global awareness uh, with the purpose of exploiting the natural world and the peoples of the world as it is today, then globalization is a curse. But if it shifts to, uh, to the values of global partnership, and on global interdependence, then it's a blessing. But growth in uh, the living world doesn't mean just expansion. It means, say, in a, in a human being, uh, development to maturity. It means also inner growth. So growth needs to be qualified. You know, Exxon, Exxon made a huge profit from that oil spill. The, the, the GNP of Alaska rose sharply after the oil spill, but that's not sustainable growth. That's destructive growth. Sustainability in the definition of the World Watch Institute in Washington, D.C. is a society, a sustainable society, is a society that satisfies its needs without diminishing the chances of future generations. Is there not something which can grow because it is not damaging, occupying, it is fulfilling? And is that not what the artist has? You know, the sad story here is that we cover our... Uh, houses with the carpets and we cover our streets with the concrete and uh, we use the telephone instead of telepathy. I mean we completely with all the progress we exchange the, the, the computers for our uh, you know possibility to, uh, to our sensitivity. We don't use at all our intuition. We don't use at all our creativity. Even if we have free time we will open television and just uh, hypnotize by the programs. I was always amazed in America when there were people even sleep with the television, that with the speaker continuously talk. The moment he, he I will, you know, I was staying with some friends and I would go very slowly and switch off. The moment they switch off, the person wake up. He could not sleep without anymore. <laughs> I mean, th there are these incredible problems that we are completely disconnected, disconnected of the flow of nature. Uh, growth and cancer. I have a hypothesis which at least has, does not need so the, million, the billions of dollars for cancer research, which our present day loss of homeostasis, as the medical doctors would say, in our individual organisms is simply a reflection in our microcosmos of what in the, mic in the macrocosm is going. Our civilization has lost homeostasis, has lost the sense of the optimum and goes for the maximum. Let us, for instance, when he spoke of the breaking of the rhythms, it, today, in order to cultivate scientifically, with all the machinery we need, one acre of rice, we, we need an input of 50 
15 irrecuperable units of energy higher than the amount of calories that the, that acre of rice is going to yield if the harvest is optimal. No wonder then that the poor people get poorer and the richer people get richer. Or well, as my friend Hazel Henderson says, nothing, nothing fails like success. And that is uh, an illustration of the point that you have to optimize, as you say, and, and not maximize. Another way of uh, saying this is uh, that uh, this maximization of single variables is the definition of stress. Stress is a certain rigidity in a whole living system introduced by maximization of single variables. Whatever that variable is, whether the, the size of a city or an institution, or whether it's profits or production, whatever you maximize, if you do it long enough, will eventually destroy the system as a whole. And so we need optimization. No, I like to say one sentence which I always find so beautiful is very simple, is, is not to do, is to be. But it's very simple, but the most difficult it is. And there is another beautiful word uh, translated from Tibetan. I don't know the Tibetan, but is in English is called suchness. And suchness is something that can be described as the emptiness, but the full emptiness. So there are all these moments how to get there. The one way of, uh, when he says, to light travel, let's go to desert. But I, why desert? Because I think the, the desert is the place where there's less thing happening. It's just you and your mind. In old days, you say the Jesus, the Moses, the Muhammad, everybody went to desert like nobody, and they came back as a somebody. I mean, there must be something in this desert. <laughs> because the desert is the hardest place to go. This is the place when you are really confronted with yourself, nothing but yourself. And uh, in the situation of 65 degrees Celsius, when it's extremely hot, when you can't move, if you make three steps, I mean, your heart beat, you can't take this heat. The body uh, temperature is uh, lower than the temperature around you. So you, you are like pushing the hot wall all the time. With the hundreds of flies on my body who were sitting in my eyes, in my nose, in my mouth, because there was a li little bit of liquid, they would never go away. For four months, I, you know, I wanted to push away, I could not. I mean, that was uh, so difficult. I remember the day I wake up in a desert and that in all flies are gone. And I remember the incredible happiness I experienced, but the experience of just being there. And that happiness was not caused by any event. It was just caused by my own existence. And I realized that actually that I become one with nature, that I have a smell of nature, that I was a foreigner there all the time. That's why the flies was there. The moment I be, I, my smell was the smell of, of the earth, I was not uh, any more foreigner element. They just left away. I was the same as a rock, as a tree. And uh, that experience was so profound and so strong that uh, I, and from that moment I really understood so many things. It was like kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the moment of purity, that everything was in his place, in complete tranquil situation. You know, desert is where you really confront with yourself, with your own mind. And uh, this confrontation we try to avoid all the time. And one of the very important points is our fear to dying. Our, we have enormous fear of dying we always repress and put somewhere else and we never confront. And uh, the all work I'm trying to do is first of all, I like to put my ego out of my work because ego is something that stands in the front and is obstacle. And I want to say in all days when the artists write not name but just anonymous, it was the best thing they can do. When you, when you finish with this ego and you really try to, to empty your mind, in, then, uh, then you are ready to, uh, to help the society to change. In fact, I think meditation is needed just because we live an artificial life, because we can't be in that unspoiled nature where we have that contact with nature, with the cosmos. We miss that in our artificial life. But in meditation, we can nevertheless still find the source of our being. And that's so important. Would we not need meditation yeah. also if we have a natural life? I think as well. Probably less. Because then living in nature is already a kind of meditation. And that's a tragedy, that living in an artificial world m prevents to live in this meditative aspect. And then we, we, we have this kind of cultural schizophrenia, which we need meditation to compensate. And I think that our challenge is how to introduce intrinsically 
that dimension of depth in economy, art, exactly. everywhere. That's the, the, the challenge. I don't think that uh, everybody needs to go to the desert to, to, to mm. meditate, but I'm, I'm certainly glad that uh, she goes to the desert oh, to meditate, sure. Sure. because <laughs> these are people who, who go very far in a certain direction. If you can imagine somebody of 22 years old in Yugoslavia get naked in front of uh, 500 people outside and cut the communist star on his stomach with a razor plate, I mean, I think I create more shocks than, than I, uh, I, um, how you call, I experience shocks. <laughs> Experiencing the limits, physical and mental limits, where the human body and mind can go. The one th amazing thing is that in our body, we have uh, in every cell, there is a certain amount of energy, what we never use. We only use this amount of energy in a extremes, in a, a situation of complete stress, risk, accident, you know, then this, all these particles of energy come in one point and we do our last effort. But in normal situation we don't. But these particles of this energy who are there, this is an incredible resource. And uh, people who are busy with meditation and are busy with uh, spiritual powers, they know very well how to use this. In, in my own field, in particle physics, uh, we try to go to very high energies with these particles and that's why we have these big accelerators because you know we hope that at high energies things will be a little simpler than at medium or low energies and so in a sense it's a it's a scientific approach to go to an extreme place to start there of course uh, mystics do that too they go to extreme states of mind uh, when i uh, um, get introduced to some sufi rituals or i went to tibetans or aborigines i saw that every of these cultures actually push their body so far physically uh, in order to make this mental jump, to, to, to uh, uh, cut this idea of, of fear of death, of the fear of pain, of fear of this, all the, our body limits we live with, and we are so afraid as a, as a Western society. You personally, as a human being who happens to be a physicist, who operates on that level, how do you see fear in uh, operating in, in, in on our planet? All right, well, um, I, I see that... Uh, <clears throat> fear is the main stumbling block to <clears throat> that prevents us from uh, going through uh, the change of thinking and change of values that I believe are absolutely crucial to save the world. And uh, I think it should be taken very seriously because what we are talking about is a change of paradigms uh, that uh, begins and has to begin by questioning everything that went on before, questioning all the ideas, all the values, all the perceptions that you have had in the past. It doesn't mean that you need to throw everything away. You need to throw some things away and others you keep and others you modify, but you need to question everything. And that is, of course, very threatening. And uh, as human beings, we are afraid of change and we are reluctant to change anyway. You know, even small changes like, you know, going to a different restaurant or ordering something different in the same restaurant. We don't like to do that. But uh, this uh, radical shift of questioning everything that went on before means essentially questioning your existence. And so it's an existential fear. And uh, uh, we can talk about how to overcome it or how to help people overcome it. Uh, and I think the community plays a tremendous role that we, we need to build a community of people who have gone through the process and then can support others uh, in going through it. But the fear has to be taken seriously. When I do seminars for, for managers, I always say this. This is uh, no joking matter. And I understand very well that in addition to all the constraints that working in a company brings uh, with it, uh, there is this very serious existential fear that we need to acknowledge. There is a society in Bangalore. They want to launch a crusade. Orientals learn very quickly, uh, a crusade uh, to the West in order to help the West to develop. Uh, and the, the question we had at that time was fear. The, uh, and I had not here, by, uh, and was not prepared, the hundred different names in Sanskrit classical language for what we called fear. 
angst, tremblement, doubt, hesitation, insecurity, threat, anxiety, which is one of the uh, Sanskrit words for sin. So we should learn if, to begin to make this kind of discernment. Not all fear uh, can be put on, the, on one single back. When I want to irritate Christian theologians, I say the whole Christian and Jewish theology is nothing but the sanctification of the principle of property. There are many gods, but I'm your god. There are many wives, but she's your wife. There are many cows, in your, but that's not your neighbor's cow. The principle of pop property is the pivot of a certain type of civilization. Fear, fear emerges out of that property. I have something to lose because I possess knowledge, riches, whatever. So fear is linked with that primacy, and I should be very carefully, careful, primacy of the principle of property as guiding our wealth understanding. When there is no principle of property, there is, there is nothing to fear. I'm not saying romantically that we should all uh, lose all our fears and divest of all our things. I'm not saying that we, one has to be poor uh, 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 San Francis of Assisi. Mm -hmm. But one has to be non-attached on the one hand because your treasure, your heart, you, 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 your, your real life is not set in making a living or making a career or whatever. This, that's what is this fundamental attitude. But is that I set the values, the life somewhere else. It's waterproof. The, 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 the symbol is in, in, in many countries is the lotus, which grows in a pond of dirt. The Chinese wall. You see, we know from our society the Chinese wall is a build as a defense, you know, wall against the, the, the Genghis Khan and the wild uh, tribes from, uh, you know, from Mongolia and protecting China inside. The wall was called the dragon, the life serpent, and the dragon head must lie in the water. So that's why they build the foundation into the water. So it start from the water. When you reach to the coast, there is the small, um, very old inscription where the written is first pass on earth. And then you walk the wall and it's all the mountains and you cross half China and you, the tail of the, of the uh, dragon on the end of the wall is in the Gobi Desert. And there is another piece of stone would say heroic pass to the sky. So the all line is the mirror image of the Milky Way. And actually, it's a marriage. The dragon is the marriage between earth and sky. As you know, in the world, there are ancient cultures like the Celtics, the American Indians, in Japan, the Shintos. In Tibet, they existed, the, the burn, the ancient tradition. And it's interesting about Tibetan Buddhism is it incorporates the both together. Like, for example, when Tibet was first, uh, Buddhism came to Tibet, there was a great master called Padmasambhava. He brought all the negative energies which were really obstructing and put them into certain energy centers where he put certain statues and stupas, which really... Now, what is interesting, when Tibet was being taken over by China, some people had gone and destroyed those, those stupas, and the energy was being released. When I was staying with Aborigines, I would sit on the earth, and the man would come and say, no, 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 don't sit on this place. This place is better. Here is bad energy, and here is good energy. And he knew, and I don't. And uh, it's not so long ago in the past than in early Christian uh, churches, uh, Greek Orthodox, the Catholic, the, some old Celtic monuments, they're old in Europe, they're built on a certain energy uh, grids. Uh, and then the power of the earth could be used directly just by the being on that point. And uh, these energy grids are shifting all the time. So we don't know where are the new energy, energy grids. We just don't know. There are people who still know, for example, it's not just a kind of wishy-washy spirituality. It is neither willy woolly <laughs> but it is actually a science. Like a geomancy is a science and science. So are all these are sciences that really, there are still people. That's why my concern is that even among the Tibetans, there are few old masters who still have that kind of knowledge. That is slowly dying. 
it would be totally unrealistic to think of a paradise, or I mean, I think that the essence of a paradise is to, to have been lost. Only you see the paradise lost has a powerful uh, power, but it's lost. Evil exists. Evil cannot be explained. If I would explain evil, Oedipus complex, a little drug, your father, your parents, uh, the, the life, etc., etc., I explained it away. One thing I'm certain, you become what you hate. So, hate against the evil, écrasé l'enfant, does not work. Which means that in our modern society, we have very little ways of facing evil except violence, crushing the opponent, the, uh, the uh, enemy, and I think that we should learn, after 8,000 years of uh, human history, and I have studied the 5,000 peace treatises in the world, you know, one whole sem se seminar on this alone, which is a, an extraordinary document to human wisdom and human stupidity. This is the war which shall end all wars. That's the déjà vu. Déjà vu. Arsubanipal had said that in, in, in the 500, not BC. Uh, so, how to handle evil is a tremendous problem. You, you probably know that the, the Taoist expression for evil is that evil exists because there is goodness. Mm. And that means that there is dualism. If you can bring the dualism back to one, which you can also call integrity. Integrity is a very interesting word because it means wholeness. It also means being, being in balance, being open, and not being dualistic. So my very simple and not very, very deep answer to your question is that evil exists because there's goodness. Amen. <laughs> what we have to do is bring this together. Like, for example, the meditative tradition is that, first of all, it's important to go in the right environment. Because if you go in the right environment, because our mind is very influenced by environment. In the right environment, in the natural environment, mind becomes more receptive. Also with nature, it is said very simply, it is said the nature of mind <coughs> is also the nature of everything. So therefore, when you experience the nature of mind through the meditative method, which is the skillful means, then the wisdom of your nature of your mind, when this is experienced, then you come into touch with the real nature, the reality, the experience. This is Mahamudra. When you have that experience, then there comes spontaneity, art, there comes also discovery. Now, the doubt, it's very interesting. I used to think that the worst problem we human beings have is desire. My master, Tingu Kensrum, but he was 82 years old, perhaps the greatest living master, he says it's doubt. Because as long as we have intelligence, we doubt. Doubt is not a disease, but a symptom of lack of understanding. I want to say just something about doubt. It's what it, just when it's simple information. The one thing that amazed me again about this Aboriginal society is that when I was in the Western tribes, in Western Central Australia, there I find that in the language they don't exist yes and no because they never doubt. As long as there's samsara, there's nirvana. As long as there's nirvana, there's samsara. That's why we have a word called kada, which is pure from the beginning which is even better than the word emptiness, which you were trying to bring up that time, the shunyata. Because emptiness in the Western concept means empty, which is nihilistic. It's not that at all. It means pure from the beginning, how sky is, how nature is. Therefore, nature is such a powerful spokesman of this absolute, because it speaks without speaking. That's the suchness, that's the tathata. We must be so open and see the changes. I mean, I, I got in this room so much teachings just by observing different... Uh, um, uh, how you call the, the situations and the answer uh, question, uh, the sessions. There is one thing what I think that from Tibetans we can learn a lot. There is this wonderful Rinpoche who laugh all the time. Did you notice? So, is the amazing what you can learn from him is I think this laughter is a really good, is a technique, must be technique, because he talk about the greed, greed, he talk about desire, he talk about a lot of negative things, but then he laugh. The moment he laugh, this, the truth of this, what he's saying, 
because you love with him come on much deeper subconscious level in you then in the old thing is sent in anger he will be immediately obstacle to you because anger creates another anger but the laughter creates this opening the other thing with the Dalai Lama was fantastic you know he, he said amazing things he's so simple he said when well, they ask him but what are you going to do after this meeting he said I'm going to sleep but this is essential he's taking a rest I mean, this is the, the good teachings. Also, Dalai Lama said once, well, I was very shocked at the time, but I understand now. He said, uh, actually, you know, the Chinese invade Tibet. We are, the Chinese are our enemies. We are very grateful to our enemies because only from the enemy you can learn compassion. I think the West, that's why you remember I, I'm saying that the West is more Christian than the West looks like. <laughs> it's not a question of churches <laughs> or going to mass. I discover all these Christian syndromes in all these people who don't belong to official Christianity. A messiah, a savior, something was universal. I happen not to believe in that. I think that these are remnants of that time of colonialism, which on many other levels, and the religious to begin with, and perhaps also in the political, are overcome. So I would like not to buy, as the Americans would say, the imperialism of science, even in the best sense of the word. So I'm not against science at all. I'm against the imperialism of modern science. And I think that science is uh, opening up two new spheres. I mean, you mentioned uh, David Bohm, you didn't mention Capra, one could, or Sheldrake, or many other people. Uh, they open up to realms which really transcend. Today, science uh, is characterized by an obsession with domination and control, and not only science, but, but all of societies. <clears throat> now, these are patriarchal values that were really formulated precisely in science in the 17th century by Francis Bacon, man dominating nature. And since that time, science uh, has become dominating and exploitative. Before uh, Bacon, before the 17th century in, in Europe, the aim of science, as the aim of philosophy, and of course there was no separation between science and philosophy, the aim was to understand nature so that you could live in harmony with it. It was not to exploit nature or to dominate or control nature, because nature was seen as a living being and the way to understand a living being is not to dominate and control and exploit it, but to communicate with it. And so once the world was seen as a machine from the 17th century on, that mm -hmm. attitude of domination and control and exploitation uh, took hold. And today, sadly, we can say that most of science and te technology is very destructive, exploitative, and profoundly anti-ecological. I would not like to reduce everything to scientific reality. And I think that science are religions. I mean, once upon a time, in Christianity, they had the same kind of absolute heitsanspruch that now I discover in science. And that's why I'm a little scary, saying what once upon a time was one god, one empire, one civilization, one religion. Now it's one democracy, one science, one technology, one way of living the world and seeing the things because we have these wonderful uh, achievements. I feel very strongly that this is going to be a critical decade that uh, the survival of humanity and of the planet are at stake. We are faced today with a whole series of uh, very alarming problems that threaten the biosphere in many ways and which soon will be irreversible. And yet there are solutions, some of them even simple, but they all require a radical shift in our thinking, in our values, in our practices, in, in the ways we live. A shift that we have discussed throughout this week from fragmentation to wholeness, from quantity to quality. And a shift of emphasis, mind you, not that we want to give up quantity altogether, but a shift of emphasis from quantity to quality, from growth to sustainability, from domination to partnership. Now, given this fact that we need this radical shift at a time where it's almost too late, given the fact 
that our crisis is largely a crisis of perception. It seems to me what we need most is a massive campaign of public education. Now, I also want to say since there are many managers and entrepreneurs here in the audience that I believe it is crucial for those of us who are in business to carry this uh, new consciousness into business. And curiously, people now are arguing that it will assure long-term competitiveness if you are ecologically conscious. And so the argument is just turned around uh, because uh, people are seeing more and more that uh, to survive in uh, a business envi environment today will mean sooner or later to be ecologically conscious or you won't survive. Like evolution, you know, everything is changing all the time, and, and our Earth is changing, and we are changing, and we are all the time. This everything is to do with relationships, you know, taking another relationship to the to the to the our galaxy, another relationship to our planet, another relationship the man to man. I mean, so is um, I think the only thing what I wish really in that the man should start uh, be conscious about his mind and his uh, possibility as a human being and really use his body and, you, and use these possibilities. And he should start immediately, now. This, tomorrow is too late, but really now. And then hopefully that we can, uh, we can uh, die with uh, that knowledge. Because, uh, you know, whatever future is, everybody die on the end. And uh, I'm really interested more about dying. This is my, uh, not about uh, the vision of the happy world and not about this. Whatever world will be, I, I'm really believing that we d disturb this earth very badly. And I think that this uh, summer, you know, February, it's not normal. And I think that uh, we will uh, face very soon big catastrophes. Uh, not uh, nuclear, not uh, humankind, but natural disasters. And I think we are not ready for natural disasters. I think that Western society, the idea of that is so removed. The will, their will is das Ursein. That the primordial being is will. That I think is the Western dogma. And then everything has to be on willpower. And I even want to be creative. And by this, I kill creativity. Creativity has to search like the mushrooms. Creativity is that thing which has to be so spontaneous so natural, so flowing without taking it for granted, that I, that any kind of will interfering, intention, uh, being inside the effort to be creative, kills creativity itself. The first thing in which you enter into contact with the divine is beauty. Without the sensitivity, the openness to beauty, to form, to shape, to what the Greek called the morphe. Without that kind of thing, life is boring. My main task is to make of that portion of reality, which is myself, to make that something harmonious, beautiful, genuine, and authentic. I mean, if that part of portion of the universe in which I have a certain power, I succeed in transforming it as I would like to be, that has a contagion power by itself to the others. To walk in beauty is that extraordinary expression of the American Indians. To live means to walk in beauty.